It was a really great weekend. Um, we were very happy and excited to spend time with our students and uh, really build those relationships with them outside of uh, here and outside of the church walls and um, in uh, some different elements. So yeah, we had an awesome time evangelizing. So I want to talk about evangelism for a few minutes this morning, not only because it is undercurrent Sunday, but also because it has been a very long 15 months. We're finally starting to see things sort of shift back to the way that they were before. We're kind of seeing things go back to normal. Bit by bit, restrictions are coming down, slowly but surely. But I want to encourage us, the church, this morning, to see this not as an opportunity to go back to normal, but as an opportunity to go forward with the gospel of Jesus in bigger ways than ever before. So I'm reading from the book of Romans this morning. So you got a Bible on you. Maybe you got the Bible app on your phone. You can turn there with me now. We are looking at the book of Romans. And we are diving into chapter 10, starting with verse 8 and reading through to verse 15. So Romans 10, verses 8 through 15. This is what it says. It says, but what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. You bow your heads with me in prayer this morning. God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this place and for the people here, the people watching online. Just pray as we enter into this time of just dwelling and, and resting on your word that um, it, will be, it will be your voice, it will be your words um, resonating through this place and through people's computer screens through their TVs, however they're joining us this morning. Thank you for undercurrent. Thank you for students who are willing to just come alongside us um, as part of the church. Um, we're just so excited to see the next generation being brought up as leaders. That's what we want. We want to see the students and the youth in our churches um, just stepping up to the plate, um, just finding a place where they belong and where they fit. Um, and that's so cool to see. It's so exciting, and we give you the glory for that. So we just pray as we uh, uh, move into the word again this morning that you will just be resting on our hearts, um, that your thoughts will be our thoughts, your heart will be our heart. Uh, and just pray that we focus in and uh, um, line ourselves up with your kingdom and with your will. You are good. We love you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. So Romans chapter 10. The book of Romans. This is Apostle Paul's letter to the church in Rome. It's one of the longest epistles in the New Testament, matching 1 Corinthians with 16 chapters. And if ever you are walking with someone through what it means to be a Christian, you've got to direct them to the book of Romans. The Gospels, of course, uh, the book of Genesis, uh, even the book of Acts, I would say, with its uh, explanation of the birth and the growth of the early church, I would say all very important for new Christians. But beyond that, 
absolutely the book of Romans. Get them in there. Get them digging deep into that book as well. It is Paul's very detailed statement outlining the gospel of Christ. Pure and simple. It is a full explanation and presentation of God's plan for salvation for humanity. If you've ever heard of the Romans Road, you've heard of the Romans Road, anyone? Yeah? Sort of biblical roadmap uh, of the gospel and salvation. That is from the book of Romans. Yes, who knew? The book of Romans. The Romans Road. Uh, Paul, had not, he had not actually been to Rome before he wrote this letter. He had plans to travel there and, and to minister to the church there. And part of his purpose in writing was to sort of prepare them for his visit and the sorts of things that he was going to be addressing, which is probably why Romans includes such a detailed account of the gospel. He also had another purpose for writing, and this was to bring some attention to a certain conflict that was going on in Rome uh, between the Jews and the Gentile believers. I will go into more detail on what this conflict was in a bit, but for now, let's just start to unpack this passage that we are focusing on this morning and what it means for us as Christ followers in 2021. So let's look at verses 8 through 10 again. And I'm just going to add verses 5 through 7 as well, just for some additional context. So here's what it says. It says, Moses writes this about the righteousness that is by the law. The person who does these things will live by them, but the righteousness that is by faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Okay, it's a mouthful. This is what I like to call the philosophical Paul, okay? Anyone here ever taken a philosophy course before? A couple of you, maybe, yes. If you've taken philosophy, you're probably familiar with Aristotle, probably familiar with Plato. So some of these really popular titles, you might be reading like the Nicomachean Ethics, you might be reading Plato's Republic, and a lot of times, at least for me, they are going on these long-winded monologues about truth or life or morality, and it just seems like you're reading a bunch of run-on sentences that sort of go in one ear and out the other. And that's kind of what these verses feel like with Paul, a little bit. For me, at least, the first time I read them, that's kind of what it felt like. Uh, but it's, it's, it is a little tough to decipher what he's saying, especially in the first half of that passage, ascending, descending, bring the gospel down, bring it up. Uh, it's a little tough to decipher. Uh, but essentially, what Paul is doing is describing what exactly it was that Jesus did for us. He's saying, because of Jesus, we live in righteousness that is by faith. Which means, if we declare with our words that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be made righteous and we will be made saved. No one needs to ascend into heaven in order to bring the gospel down. No one needs to raise Jesus from the dead in order to bring the gospel up. It's not that complex. It's very simple because Jesus, he already came. Jesus already died. He already went to the cross. God the Father already raised him. And so Paul is saying, because of Jesus, because of what Jesus has done, the message of the gospel, it is available and it is accessible to anyone. Speaking on evangelism, evangelism means making the accessible mystery apparent. Let me say that again. Evangelism means making the accessible mystery apparent parent. I've already mentioned Plato. I'll talk about him some more. I have an English degree that I never use, so why not? In Plato's Republic, we read about what Plato describes as the allegory of the cave. 
Anyone know this? The allegory of the cave? A couple hands. Uh, in this allegory, Plato paints a picture of these individuals, and they are trapped inside a cave, and they're unable to turn their heads. So all that they can see is the wall of the cave in front of them, and behind them, there is a fire burning, and it's casting shadows on the wall. And all the individuals know to be real and true are the shadows of these existing objects behind them. And it's not until they're released from the cave that they can understand that the shadows were merely their perception of what the objects actually were. And what Plato is trying to get at with this allegory is that it's only through experience and knowledge or education that we can truly grasp the full reality or that, that real truth. You know, too often I think that we might feel like the truth of the gospel, it's so obvious and mainstream that we neglect to carry out the great commission of Christ as outlined at the end of Matthew's gospel. Maybe I've told this story before, maybe I haven't. Uh, a number of years ago, I was playing music with some of my friends uh, for the week during chapel services at a Bible camp. Uh, we wanted to synchronize our music sets with the speaker's lessons. And so my friend, he asked the speaker, uh, you know, when do you plan on sharing the salvation message? When do you, you know, wh what night are you planning to like just clearly outline what it means to be a Christian and how these people can give their heart to Jesus? And I'll never forget the speaker's response. It floored me. He said, you know, I wasn't really planning to dedicate a lesson to that. He said, I think it's a little naive to think that everyone here hasn't heard the salvation message at least once in their life. What? What? Sir? Okay? I think, actually, it's a little naive to think that they all have. Right? Church, there is a reason that Paul describes the truth of the gospel as the mystery of Christ. Ephesians 3 verse 4, by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. Colossians 1 27, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. A few chapters after our passage in Romans 16 verse 25, now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past. Evangelism it's making the accessible mystery apparent. This is one of the most important things that we will ever do for the kingdom of God on this earth. This is why Paul was so intentional about the details of the gospel as he wrote to the Romans. This is why he says what he says. What is righteousness by faith? I haven't visited Rome yet. I haven't spoken to you guys. I can't expect that you know what I'm talking about. Faith, righteousness by faith. It is to declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and to believe in your heart that God the Father raised him from the dead. Through this, you will be made righteous and you will be saved. How many people do you know that have a good understanding of the Bible, but not a good understanding of the gospel? I ran into these people a lot during my liberal arts degree. People who have maybe read the Bible, or at least parts of it. They've studied it, but they, it really is just a book to them. This is because the mystery is accessible, but it hasn't been made apparent. I watch a lot of YouTube. Anyone else watch YouTube? <laughs> there are a number of channels on there that I follow, much to my wife's detriment sometimes. I think I overwatch sometimes. <laughs> uh, but one of the channels that I follow, it's called Good Mythical Morning, uh, and it is these two middle-aged guys, uh, and they host a morning talk show, Friday, Monday through Friday, they play games uh, together, they, they eat weird foods, they have little contests. It's fun. They've been friends th since they were six years old. Uh, they're in their mid-40s now. They live in Los Angeles now. They're originally from North Carolina. And they grew up in the church. 
and they describe who they used to be as evangelical Christians. And they worked for uh, Crusaders for Christ with their university for a number of years before they started their internet careers. They were very involved with their churches. And then over time, throughout their adulthood, they stepped away from their faith, and they haven't gone back. And one of them attributes his falling away to this constant feeling of guilt and how he always felt like he needed to repent or that God was disappointed in him. He didn't understand how God could just forgive him for sinning. And it was this constant stress in his life. He decided that a faith that made him feel so stressed and anxious all the time probably wasn't a faith worth living. He decided, you know, that if, if, God, if God is making me stressed, if he's making me anxious and afraid that I'm, I'm going to burn in hell, then I don't really want to follow that God. And I listened to his story, and I thought to myself, you know, how, how sad is it that his understanding of grace is so skewed? How sad is it that he has this deep and solid understanding of the Bible, but the truth of the gospel, it's still a mystery? Paul, he wanted the Romans to know straight up, this is what it means to be a Christ follower. This is what Jesus came to do. This is what it means for you and for me. It doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, where you've been, where you're going. God stepped down and entered in through Christ the Son and died and rose again so that you and you and you and you and you could declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead so that you can be made righteous and so that you can be saved. Jesus made the mystery accessible. He came and he died, and he rose again, and he bridged that gap between us and God the Father. He made the mystery accessible, and the commission of Christ means that we pick up that torch. And through the power of the Holy Spirit working in us, we help to make the mystery apparent. There are lots of souls outside these walls who know that something is missing. They're filling an emptiness with money, filling it with sex, drugs, alcohol, extravagant vacations, elegant restaurants, online shopping. Some of it's to cover up the fact that maybe they're feeling miserable. Others, you know, they might feel like they're on top of the world, but maybe, maybe you know, if all those good, good things in their life was stripped away, maybe they wouldn't really know where to turn. Maybe they've thought about God. Maybe they've even prayed a few times or read some of the Bible because the mystery is accessible but it hasn't yet been made apparent. Evangelism is making the accessible mystery apparent, but it doesn't stop there. Because evangelism, it has this awesome way of snowballing. The Holy Spirit, he has this way of getting into our hearts and our souls and radiating from the inside out. Because not only does evangelism, uh, evangelism make the accessible mystery apparent, evangelism breeds evangelism. Evangelism breeds evangelism. Let's read the second part of our passage again. Starting at verse 11 through to verse 15. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Look, we're close, okay? We're close. It's been a long road since March 2020. I think everyone can agree with me, but we are getting very close to putting this pandemic behind us. And I want to urge you this morning, as the doors of a post-pandemic world are opened up, don't shut yourself inside the doors of the church. Instead, open up the doors to the kingdom of God. Don't shut yourself inside the doors of the church. Open the doors to the kingdom of God. 
evangelism breeds evangelism. And I know how easy it's going to be to say, hey, this is awesome. We can meet at full capacity again. We could do away with the masks during, during our church service. We can have our after church luncheons. We can get everyone back inside the church and we can be together and it will be good because it's been so long. And I'm just so excited for things to go back to normal in the church. I know how easy it's going to be. But arm yourself with a healthy caution of going back to normal because the church can't use this as an opportunity to go back. No, we've got to use this as an opportunity to go forward. And going forward doesn't only happen inside these walls because evangelism doesn't only happen inside these walls. Jesus didn't go to the temples to find his disciples. He didn't bust open the doors of the synagogue and say, Hello! It is I, Jesus Christ. Lend me your best priests and your top scripture literaries, for there is work to be done. He didn't do that. <laughs> he also wasn't kind of British. <laughs> but he didn't do that. He went to the tax collectors, right? He said, he said, Matthew, let me show you a better life than money. He went to the fishermen. He said, Andrew, Simon, you know, you've, you've spent your whole careers as fishermen. Let me show you how to be fishers of men. See, Jesus knew that evangelism breeds evangelism. And so he wasn't concerned with shutting himself inside the doors of the temples with the greatest religious leaders of the time, but he was concerned with opening the doors of the kingdom of God to the unbelievers. And he was so concerned with this, in fact, that the religious leaders looked at him and they said, what's he doing? He's associating with thieves. He's talking to prostitutes. He's eating with the lowlifes. This is not where a teacher of the law belongs. But Jesus, he flipped this entire concept right on its head. He said, actually, no. This is exactly where I need to be because they're, these are the people who need to know the grace and mercy of the Father the most. And this is exactly what Paul is writing about in his letter to the Romans. I mentioned earlier there is this tension between the Jews and the Gentile believers within the city. Because all of a sudden, these non-Jewish Christians were burgeoning, and word was spreading that the same God who brought the Jewish ancestors out of Egypt and led them into the Promised Land, the same God who set apart the Jewish nation, the, 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 the Israelite nation, as his own, his chosen people, had now come as a sacrifice in Christ for the sins of not only the Jews, but the Gentiles too. And so the Roman Jews, they were turned off. They said, what good is it then to come from the line of Abraham if these non-Jewish Christian converts have access to the same benefits as we do? The Gentile believers, they were turned off, and they said the Jews, they're just jealous that they aren't the priority anymore. After all, it was their religious leaders that were trying to get Jesus arrested in the first place. But Paul, he wrote to put an end to the debate in and I, I love that Paul, this Jewish, born-again Christian, he doesn't take a side here. He actually affirms the Jews. Romans 1, verse 16, it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Again, in Romans 3, verses 1 and 2, what advantage then is there in being a Jew, or what value is there in circumcision? Much in every way. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God and then establishing the importance of that Jewish heritage. In Romans 9, verse 5, theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all, forever praised. What Paul is saying is, look, there is deeply rich history and value in being a part of the Jewish people. Abraham, Moses, Aaron, David, Jesus Christ himself, you've all come from this bloodline. God chose your nation to bring about the Savior of the entirety of humanity, and that's why your ancestry is so important. But listen, listen. When that Savior came, 
when Jesus came, God was ready to win the world. That's what he did. Because right from the start, he wasn't in it for just a piece of his people. He was in it for all of them. And in verses 14 and 15 of our passage, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Evangelism breeds evangelism. Paul's saying there's good news for those who don't know the name of Jesus. Jew, Gentile, it doesn't matter. There's good news that they need to hear, and those are the people that we need to be concerned about. Stop shutting yourself inside the doors of the temples of of pride. Stop shutting yourself inside the doors of your temples of jealousy, of conflict and self-righteousness. And start opening the doors to the kingdom of God for those who haven't heard the good news yet. Because otherwise, how will they know? How will they know if we don't tell them? How can they go and tell others if we don't tell them first? Church, how is a world that's so far off track from the gospel of Jesus going to know about it? if we don't tell them about it. And it's good to have everyone back here together. It's so good to see the light at the end of this COVID-19 tunnel. I'm excited to come here every Sunday and see these pews fill up more than they ever have in the last 15 months. I'm excited uh, for us to be finally be able to start children's ministry again. Come on. I'm excited to re-enter into the community that we have built in this place as a church family. But if this pandemic has taught the church anything, it's that evangelism breeds evangelism. And so we can't just go back. We've got to go forward. And that means that we've got to go out. We've got to build community out there. We've got to worship out there. We've got to love out there, not just in here. And that's why it's so important that we keep pouring into things like our online ministry, that we prayerfully send people like, like Graham and Kathleen and, and, and Dave Small into their missional callings, and that we keep supporting and encouraging events like Undercurrent. Myself and uh, Spencer and Michelle... And Dave, we got to see these kids spread hope this weekend. See, there's more, <clears throat> there's more hope in a world where the love of Jesus is being spread on a daily basis. Even if it's just a kind gesture, if it is done with a heart of servitude, and if it is done for Jesus, that's adding hope to the world, because it's about planting those seeds, right? Investing in the kingdom, it doesn't have to mean that you are verbally implanting the mission of Christ into everyone's minds that you meet, as long as it's always in yours. Jesus is in the business of taking what we give him and multiplying it tenfold, a hundredfold, which, which means that a frozen, minis- uh, or a frozen meal gifted in Jesus' name can become a restored faith. It means that helping out at a homeless shelter with a heart for Jesus can become an opportunity to share the gospel of hope, to make the mystery apparent with someone who forgets what hope even feels like. It means meeting that cashier from Starbucks or or the the waiter from that restaurant in heaven one day, and they embrace you and they tell you all that they did, all that they were able to accomplish for the kingdom of God and for Jesus because they asked you why were you being so kind to them that one time when maybe the store was really busy and everyone else was getting upset, and you told them, well, it's because Jesus, he transformed my life for the better, and I want to help to make other people's lives better too. Paul urged the Romans against being so caught up in this Jew-Gentile conflict that they missed what was happening outside the doors of their temples. How many times have we been more concerned about what God is doing in our church than what he's doing in our world? As a church member, as pastor, I love to see what God's doing in here. I love it. 
I love to see our church ministries grow. I love to look out and see people lifting their hands during worship because they're having an authentic Holy Spirit encounter. As a church member and as a pastor, I love those things. But as a Christ follower, I need to get equally, if not more, excited to see God using me to move out there. We've had an incredible mystery made apparent to us. We need to get excited to make that mystery apparent to those who are lost and seeking. Get involved in this place. Make community. Really love your church. But don't shut yourself inside its doors. God came to this earth in the flesh through Jesus Christ to make a sacrifice that would win over the entire world, not just those of us who are raised in the church, not just those of us who sing in the worship team, not just the vocational pastors like myself or Pastor Perry. He didn't only come for us. He came to win the world, all of humanity. And there are lots of people out there who don't know that yet. What an incredible truth to share with them, right? What an incredible opportunity to be able to tell someone, hey, did you know that there's a perfect heavenly father who loves you with every ounce of your being? Did you know that he loves you so much that he took on flesh in Christ the Son in order to die for you so that you could be made righteous and saved? Did Did you know that that same God, he wants a deep and intimate personal relationship with you? the best news that anyone could ever hear. And they're out there. They're waiting to hear it, even if they don't know it yet. Don't go back, church. Don't go back. Go forward. Go out. With awesome Holy Spirit power, go out and open doors to the kingdom of God. Partner with Jesus on this amazing adventure. Make the accessible mystery a parent. Would you pray with me this morning? God, thank you for everything that you have done. Thank you for this awesome mystery that has been revealed to us. Thank you that it has been made apparent to us in whatever way. I just pray that we will carry that torch that we will go out, that we will go forward, strive to make the mystery apparent for those who don't know it yet. You're so good, God. We know that we go in your power. We know we go in your grace and in your love. It's a really incredible and beautiful truth to walk in day after day. We give this time to you. We know that you're here. We thank you. We love you. We pray these things in your name. Amen.